How you doing this morning? Awesome. Let's dive in, right? Revelation chapter 18, as we get into the Word of God, let us pray. And as we pray, we want to remember the families of the victims that were in that massacre, that terrorist attack in New Zealand. Let us pray. Father, we ask, uh, Lord, that you will remember the families who are grieving today, Father, in the aftermath of this terrorist attack in New Zealand at the mosque. Father, we pray, Father, for these families. We know that your word says you're the God of all comfort and compassion, and your comfort and compassion is not limited to a certain ethnicity or belief or anything, Lord. You are there when men cry. And I pray, Father, that in their comfort that they would come to the understanding, Lord, that Jesus Christ is able to be a comfort and a help in this time of tremendous need. We pray that what the devil has meant for evil, for he has reared his ugly head once again, that you somehow, Lord, would turn it out for good. Father, comfort those who mourn and who weep. Hear their cry, we pray. We pray, Lord, that you would have mercy. Father, we pray today that you will bless your word as it goes forth. It will go with your promise that it will not return to you void, but accomplish that which you send it to do. We pray that you would grant us ears to hear, Lord. Help us to kind of wake up, dear God, from our sleep. And, Father, to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. We commit this time to you. Thank you that we can gather here. We give you all the praise and glory, and we ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Revelation chapter 18, I've entitled this message, Babylon is Fallen. The reign of mankind is now coming to a close. Here in chapter 18, we find four voices. It is the voice of condemnation, the voice of separation, the voice of lamentation, and the voice of celebration. Following the demise of the super church, that is the false apostate church referred to as the great city, in Revelation chapter 17, verse 18, following that demise, we now come, or we now have before us, the downfall of Babylon the Great. Now, some have speculated, as I've mentioned before, if you've been here in our study through the book of Revelation, that uh, many believe Babylon is merely, Babylon is merely a world system. However, as we go through the text, we'll see that it is not only a world system or ideology, it is also a particular place. At this point, the return of Christ is at hand. Jesus Christ is coming. This is the tail end of the seven-year tribulation period. The Lord is ready, ready to descend and to come back to the earth. But before his return, uh, the way must be prepared through the destruction of Babylon. And it's the destruction of Babylon, it, it all dependent upon uh, mankind's Resources and all dependence upon mankind's religion, all dependence upon mankind's remedies must cease before Jesus can come and rule and reign as Lord. Worldwide reliance upon Jesus alone will replace mankind's reliance upon Babylon and Babylon's system. We find here first the voice of condemnation, verses 1 to 3. Read along with me. The Bible says, John writes, after these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven and having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory, and he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit in a cage, for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. The evil, rebellious spirit of Babylon, which consumed the false church, here now is going to consume the economic and political power of the Antichrist. 
Babylon represents a place where demons dwell, where they have free reign, a place where every foul spirit is, and, and, is, is, and it is, I should say, a cage for every unclean and hated bird. This is speaking of simply satanic or demonic activity running rampant throughout the entire world. And we saw earlier in the book of Revelation where people will actually outright worship the devil. All the nations who are under her influence or drunken influence will suffer the wrath of God, verse 3 tells us. The merchants of the earth uh, have prospered through the abundance of her luxury, the latter part of verse 3 says. Now, some scholars, again, I want to kind of address this again. I addressed it once before, but some believe that, that Babylon here is actually the ancient city of Babylon rebuilt. Now, the ruins of the city of Babylon, ancient city of Babylon, are there in, in Iraq today, uh, uh, near the Euphrates River. And, um, but I, I, I wonder, I think here that uh, uh, Scripture, I don't think, I know that Scripture suggests that the use of the name Babylon here may simply be symbolic. It may well be speaking of another city, not the ancient Babylonian city. And I believe this is really the case. And why? Well, two biblical reasons. Number one is after the Medes and Persians were destroyed, or the Medes and Persians destroyed Babylon, uh, historians tell us around uh, October the 12th, 539 B.C., God declared that the glory and beauty of Babylon would never exist again. How then can it be rebuilt? We find that declaration from the Lord in Isaiah chapter 13, verses 17 to 22. Here's the second reason I believe that this, is, this name Babylon is just uh, uh, is symbolic of this city and the system of the world. And that is in Revelation chapter 11, verse 8. Uh, Revelation 11, verse 8, remember there, Jesus referred to Jerusalem uh, by another name. He called Jerusalem Sodom and Egypt. Why, and why would he do that? Well, because we know that uh, at that particular time during the tribulation period, uh, Gentiles will uh, uh, basically overrun Jerusalem. They will have their way in Jerusalem, and God was referred to Jerusalem, the city, as Sodom and Egypt. So it is not... Uh, uh, um, a stretch to believe that Babylon here is really a name ascribed to another city. Some think the city is Rome. We don't know. It's all speculation. But I believe it's ascribed to another city, not the ancient city, Babylon. What we do know for certain here is that this voice here is one of condemnation and judgment. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And all who follow her will fall as well. In verses 4 to 8, we continue through in verse 4, the Bible says, John says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities, rendered to her as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works in the cup which she has mixed, mixed double for her. In other words, Babylon has brought this on herself. In the measure, verse 7, in the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure, give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as queen and am no widow and will not see sorrow. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. Now we come to the voice of separation. Voice of separation, the Lord says, come out from her to the tribulation saints, those who come to Christ during the tribulation. There's a call to come out from her. Excuse me, from underneath her Babylonian or the Babylonian influence. She has condemned herself, and now the full payment of her condemnation has come upon her. One of the things people forget sometimes, I think willingly forget, and what we need to understand that apart from our forgiveness in Jesus Christ, apart from the atoning work of the cross, 
When we sin against God, we are actually storing up for ourselves punishment. And people think, well, you know, I can be saying, oh, God's going to kind of, you know, give me a wink and a nod and let me slide or whatever. No. Sin must be punished. And with every sin, apart from the atoning work of Jesus Christ, God places on the ledger and, and demands an accounting. And here she has added up for us of all these sins against her. She's basically condemning herself. And that's exactly what mankind does when we reject Jesus Christ. We have condemned ourselves. He who has the Son of God has life. Who has, does not have the Son of God does not have life. He who does not have the Son of God, Jesus said, is condemned already. That sin's placed in your ledger, and you, that sin, your own sin, will end up condemning you. Because sin has a payday. Sin has a payday. The good news is that on the cross, the full weight of our sin, the wages of our sin, was, was laid upon our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And through faith in him, we can be forgiven. John puts it, I mean, Paul puts it this way when he said in Romans chapter 6, you know it very well, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The voice here is reflective of Jeremiah's prophecy as well. In Jeremiah's day, the ancient city of Babylon existed, and Jeremiah prophesied against that ancient city of Babylon, which would be destroyed by the Medes and the Persians. And this is what Jeremiah said about Babylon then, and it's a reflection of what's happening, taking place with Babylon here uh, in the tribulation period, toward the end of the tribulation period. Jeremiah chapter 51, and this is from the New Living Translation. And Jeremiah declared, flee from Babylon, save yourselves. Don't get trapped in her punishments. It is the Lord's time for vengeance. He will repay her in full. Babylon has been a gold cup in the Lord's hand, a cup that made the whole earth drunk. The nations drank Babylon's wine, and it drove them all mad. But suddenly, Babylon too has fallen. Weep for her. Give her medicine. Perhaps she can yet be healed. We would have helped her if we could, but nothing can save her now. Let her go. Abandon her. Return now to your own land, for her punishment reaches to the heavens. It is so great, it cannot be measured. This is what we see happening to the Babylon of the tribulation period. God's judgment falling upon them. And there is a call because of God's impending judgment or his imminent judgment. It's a call to God's people to be separate themselves uh, from this Babylonian system of iniquities. Because judgment has come. In verses 7 and 8, seven and eight we see the arrogance of Babylon, which is a reflection of the arrogance we find even in the world today. I sit as queen, she will say, and am no widow and will not see sorrow. And verse 8 declares that she, in one day, that there will be death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire. I sit as queen. We see that today. People say, oh, we don't need God. We can fix ourselves. But the world grows sicker every single day. And people actually think, oh, I'm not going to suffer sorrow. Oh, you know, my, my gated community, my riches, and my fame will protect me. But don't you we read the newspapers? Don't you? Well, they don't know paper anymore, amen? <laughs> don't you read, look at the, the news reports of celebrities, people who have everything that you long for, who end up taking their lives, who are miserable. Because only God, the Bible says, can satisfy the human soul. Amen. Yes. Amen. Like Babylon, people will resist God until it's too late. You know, there's a time when it can be too late. Proverbs warns us in Proverbs 29, it says, He who is often rebuked and hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed in that without remedy. That's exactly what's happening here with Babylon in the tribulation period, and it's exactly what happens to the hardness of men's hearts who rebel against God. There's going to come a time when it's too late. The most tormenting memory you'll have in hell 
is the opportunity you had to go to heaven and refuse. Jesus said the rich man was in torment. He looked over to Abraham's bosom. The Jewish people believed in the place of the, the, the righteous dead and the place of the evil dead. He was in the place, the rich man was in the place of the evil dead, tormented by flames. He said, I'm tormented in this flame. Could you dip your finger in a cup of cool water and just touch my tongue? I don't need a full glass of water. Just, just dip your finger and touch my tongue. It couldn't be done. He says, there's a great chasm between us. We can't come to you, and you can't come to us. He said, then send back somebody to warn my brothers of this place. Please tell them, don't come here. What was the response? They have Abraham and the prophets. Let them hear them. There will be those who will die and go to the place of torment. Now, listen, there's another place. The place of torment is not the place of hell. We'll get into that in chapter 19 and chapter 20 of the book of Revelation. We'll talk about some of that. But you're in torment and there's some who are in torment today who have rejected Jesus Christ, who are saying, oh, if I could just go back and warn my friends, like I warn my brother, my sister, if I could warn those that I love, please give me a second, Lord, to go back. Then I know they'll believe if I could just go back and say, don't come to this place. And the same response is they have Abraham and the prophets. They have the word of God. They've heard the preaching and the teaching of the word. Let them hear the word. Let them put their faith in that. The Bible says in hell, the worm dieth not. That means the memory is still alive. And replayed for all eternity in torment is the reminder of all the times you had to come to Christ and refuse. You don't want to go there. I'm glad you're here today. Amen. I'm glad you're here today. But there's a time when it will be too late. Her judgment takes place quickly, verse 8 says. It says in one day, that one day could literally be one hour. It literally means a time and space. Uh, I say literally means it, it's, it could also mean one hour, but it literally means a time and space between Dawn and dusk or a 24-hour period. In one day, Babylon will be destroyed. Now, many believe that the destruction of Babylon described here and in verses 9 and 10 may refer to a sudden nuclear attack. I mean, we we didn't have the technology 200 years ago for in one day. You could destroy a city, but, you know, all of Babylon, all the world, in one day being affected. I was reading an article the other day. It was dated February the 25th, 2019. It caught my attention. Here's the title. You probably have seen this article. Uh, It's a long title, but here's what it said. It said, Russia threatens to vaporize U.S. cities. Here are the areas in the U.S. most likely to be hit in a nuclear attack, close quote. So I read on. (laughs) Amen. Amen. The article said, it said that Russia stated, Russian state Media on Sunday made a shocking threat, even by its own extreme standards, that detailed how Moscow would annihilate U.S. cities and areas after a nuclear treaty collapse collapsed and put the Cold War rivals back in targeting mode. Russian President Vladimir Putin has threatened a new Cuban missile crisis with deployments near the U.S. borders and to aim missiles at the cities that command armed forces that that command armed forces but russia's media took it a step further by naming their new targets now probably in response to the russian threat i read another article where it stated that the united states air force is fast tracking the production of a new generation of nuclear armed intercontinental ballistic missiles icbms of which a prototype is how fast it's going to be moving, will be available as soon as next year. I hope they hurry up. (laughs) Because Colorado Springs is on Russia's hit list. Just say it. Amen. 
we'll get to heaven before we're everybody. Amen. <laughs> Amen. That's a good thing, I guess. All right. But in reality, according to prophecy, end times prophecy, I believe we'll be out of here when this ha- takes place because a nuclear attack against the United States of America may be the very uh, opportunity that Gog, the leader of Magog, the leader of the, an ancient name for Russia, is looking for, according to Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, to come down in a nor- an invasion from the north into Israel. Because in that attack in Ezekiel 38 and 39, America is not mentioned. The West, Western power, is not mentioned. I wonder. Just saying. Amen. Amen. But here in our text with the impending judgment of Babylon so near, God warns the saints of the tribulation, just as he warned Noah, just as he warned Lot, just as he's warning us, the church today, in preparation for the rapture of the church, to come out from among Babylonian worldly influence. The third voice that we find here is the voice of lamentation, the voice of lamentation, of sorrow. Verses 9 to 13, read along with me. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning standing at a distance for fear of her torment what's this for fear of her torment could be uh, for fear of um, uh, nuclear fallout and for fear of being contaminated by radioactive nuclear fallout so They stand afar off and they weep. Standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour, that is either literally or figuratively, but one hour, something that happens, boom, immediately, your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys her merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet and every kind of uh, citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of uh, most precious wood, bronze and iron and marble and cinnamon and incense and fragrant oil and frankincense and wine and, and, uh, and oil. Uh, fragrant oil and wine and oil, uh, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots and bodies and souls of men. Now again, he is speaking in his terms, his language, you know, but body and souls of men. They are weeping, not over their sins, but they're weeping over the loss of riches. People love their money. Money make you funny. If you're not careful. And they were weeping over their loss. This is a narcissistic cry. The wailing of a soul consumed with self. I was reading where psychologists today have diagnosed narcissism as a disorder. It's called narcissistic personality disorder, NDP. It's defined this way. A pattern of self-centered, arrogant thinking and behavior, a lack of empathy for uh, empathy and consideration for other people, an excessive need for admiration. Someone's always got to be stroking you. Narcissism. And notice something, too, in the latter part of verse 13, human trafficking is alive and well just before the return of Jesus Christ. It's not going to go away. It says that the, 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 uh, and the bodies and souls of men, the selling, the merchandising of the bodies and souls of men, that Greek word for man is, is the Greek word anthropos, and it simply means human beings. That means men, women, and children are being trafficked. In verses 14 to 19, we find the indictment against them. 
In verse 14, the Bible says, the fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you. Oh, that which you just had to have, that which you abandoned your family for, that which you gave your body and your soul to, that the devil lied and told you would make you happy and satisfy you, that which you longed for is gone. It's gone from you, and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. The merchants of these things have become rich by her, will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour, suddenly, without warning, such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who travel, travel by ship, sailors, and as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what is like this great? city and they threw dust on their heads and cried out throwing dust on your head is a sign of mourning and they cried out weeping and wailing and saying alas alas the great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth for in one hour she is made desolate the voice of lamentation voice of mourning. The indictment is that she longed for the things of Babylon, but not the things of God. And now all the things she longed for are gone. The earth is covered with lamentation. The earth is covered with sounds of sorrow. And now we come to the last voice. The last voice is a voice of celebration. While the world is mourning, heaven is rejoicing. Amen. Mankind's reign is coming to an end. Verse 20, rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus, with violence, the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. The sound of the harpists, musicians, and the flutists, the flautists, <laughs> and trumpeters shall not be heard in her anymore. No more MTV. Amen. No more American bandstand. No, that's, that's long. I ended a long time ago. Amen. <laughs> No more music. Music has ceased. The sound of, of harpists and musicians and, and all will be gone. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in her anymore. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard in her, in you. Uh, it will not, be, will not be heard in you anymore. The sound of a millstone, what is that all about? Well, you know, in ancient times, you know, in Jesus' time, you'd always hear in a prosperous town, such as Capernaum, where Jesus had his headquarters. And you can still go there today, today and see the ruins of Capernaum, and you still see these millstones lying around on the ground. And they would use those millstones to grind the wheat. And so when things were good, the economy was good, and things were prospering and all, and people were prospering and could afford to buy things, you'd always hear the sound of millstones grinding out wheat. And so he's basically saying there would be no more prosperity. The economy is tanked. He says in verse 23 that the light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall not be heard in you anymore for your merchants were the great men of the earth for by their sorcery all the nations were deceived and in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. Why is the Lord saying rejoice? Because God just can't wait to get his hands around there little necks, you know. No. 
Rejoice because now God is avenging the blood that was shed by the prophets and by the saints. God is coming to avenge his people. Rejoice. Finally, the Lord has come to avenge his people. They have been deceived by the sorcery that's been peddled over the seas and all. Sorcery. The Greek word for sorcery is pharmakia. It's where we get our word pharmacy. It literally means drugs. We live in a time, even today, of great drug addiction, opioid addictions, and, and all of this. It is plaguing the entire earth, and we're now we're crying for you know, recreational drugs. We have a right to have recreational drugs, and marijuana was for medical reasons, and there are some medical reasons for it. But now we want the recreational, and, and people are even advocating other drugs should be legalized and all of this. The whole world is going to be under the influence of drugs. It kind of makes me wonder today, you know, it seems like today it seems uh, uh, when it comes to the ballot box that common sense is no longer common. And the more our society is given over to opioids and recreational drugs, the more the electorate seems to not be in its right mind. So sometimes we think, well, we're Americans, we still have a vote, but, you know, people are voting under an influence. And with a lot of the nation under the influence of opioids and, and, and recreational drugs, I don't know what kind of fool's walking up into the electoral, you know, pulling a lever or whatever, you know, because people are not in their right mind. And it's just going to continue to increase. It's not going to go away. And the whole world will be easily seduced by the Antichrist because I think the whole world will be in a stupor mentally because of opioids and recreational drugs. That's the way we're going. Scientists are warning us. Doctors are warning us, but nobody's listening because what we want, our flesh, is more important than what is right for our nation. Despite the conditions of the world, again, the Lord says rejoice. Why? Because heaven is coming. Jesus is on his way. God is vindicating and will vindicate his people. Here's the application I want to leave you with today. It's just two thoughts. The first one is this. Babylon must fall. Babylon must fall. Without the fall of Babylon, Christ did not, would not come. It must fall. Why? Because God will not share his throne with another. The God of this world has to be dethroned before Jesus Christ comes back and steps down on the Mount of Olives, before he comes back and rules for a thousand years as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Babylon had to fall because he's not going to come and share this earth with the God of this world, who is the devil. It is the very nature and character of God to do so. We see that in the Old Testament in many places. One is in relationship to Gideon. Before Gideon could, Gideon could experience the delivering power, the deliverance of God, the power of God, what did he have to do? He had to tear down his daddy's idols. And then in 1 Samuel chapter 4 and 5. There, the story, the account is given to us of how the Ark of the Covenant, you know what that is, that was the Ark of God's promise, covenant with Israel. It, it was a, a box overlaid with gold, and, and it, inside the box with the Ten Commandments and the, the, uh, the rod that, that, uh, of Aaron's that budded, and also a, a jar of manna that they captured, the, with manna that God would feed the children of Israel with in the wilderness. It was in the Ark of the Covenant. And Israel, because of their disobedience to God, lost the battle against the Philistines. They captured the Ark of the Covenant, and they took it to the temple of their god, Dagon. And they set the Ark of the Covenant right by their god, Dagon. Dagon was a, a Philistine god, a Canaanite god, had the body of a fish, a head of a man, and the hands of a man. Oddball god. <laughs> And it was standing there, and they put the ark next to it. When he came in the next morning, and guess what? The god, Dagon, the idol, had fallen before the ark of God. His head was broken off, and his hands were broken off. Amen. As if God says, the power is only in my hands, and I am the one with infinite knowledge. Amen. He will not 
share his authority with another. Babylon must fall. In the words of Isaiah, the prophet writes, Tell and bring forth your case, the Lord God says. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient times? And who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord, and there is no other God besides me, a just God and a Savior, there is none besides me. Amen. God will not allow another to share that place. To share that place in our lives. And so it is in our own lives. Amen. Amen. Before Christ can truly reign, oh, pastor, I want to see God move. I want revival. I want to see God do the things he's done before. Oh, I want him to heal my, my family. I want him to tear down your idols. Babylon must fall in your heart and in my heart before we can see a real move of God. He will not share the throne of your heart with another whether it be yourself or it be an idol, it must fall. He is the only God. He is the only Savior. There is none, he says, besides me. Amen. Praise his name. The second point that I'd like to make and leave you with is that we must come out. We must come out of the Babylonian system. Paul, quoting Isaiah 52, verse, seven, verse 11, Isaiah 52, 11, he said this, he quoting Isaiah 52, 11 in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Come out from among them. But what does it mean to come out from among them? Because we're still in the world, Amen. Many believers uh, have taken this out of context, and, and they, they resort to things like communal living. We're going to be living a commune. You know, a lot of uh, hippies and Jesus people, Jesus freaks were doing that, you know, coming out of the hippie culture. They just say, hey, we'll just have a Christian commune. And then some have uh, ascribed to the monastic order, uh, some monastic order, going to live in a monastery somewhere. You know, we got to get away from the world. We got to come out of the world. Let's build a castle or something and, f and fortify ourselves against the world. And then still, others believe. Other believers uh, uh, said, way to come out of the world and not be contaminated by the word, world is to wear certain clothing. You know, you got to wear certain clothing, and and uh, you have to adhere to certain societal rules within this particular group. Uh, groups like the the uh, Quakers and the Friends and even some uh, legalistic holiness groups, uh, you know, have mandated people look a certain way and all of this if you really want to be holy, right? And they believe that by doing so that they will uh, not be contaminated by the world. I've read stories where even in monasteries uh, they have found uh, 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 newborn babies, you know, kind of hidden between the brick and mortar of the, of the monastery because uh, the priest, uh, you know, even though they were hidden in the monastery, you know, were found to kind of um, get with some of the, the females that were there. And, um, you know, when they, women would become pregnant and, and to hide their shame and guilt, uh, the, these children were buried behind some of the monastery walls. So you can build a wall all around your house. Sin will still find you. Amen. The problem is you're there. Amen. You, you know, you got to change. It's just because we build a wall or a castle or go, go to monastic living or, or, you know, run off to a commune doesn't mean that you're safe from the attacks of the enemy. Come out from among them. Listen, God did not call us to isolate ourselves from the world. He called us to go into the world. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. So what does it mean to come out as the Lord is calling the tribulation saints out, as he's calling us out even today to be separate from the influence of the world see the problem is is that the influence of the world is in the church and that shouldn't be 
It's not what's outside that should concern us because men are going to do what men do. Sinners are going to do what sinners do. You did it. I did it. We all did it. Did it, right? That's natural. They're just doing what sinners do. The problem is when the influence is in the church. I want you to look with me to 1 Corinthians, with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And there Paul, the apostle, is addressing an issue in the church of sexual immorality. And the background to this story is that a man actually married his father's wife. He was living in sexual immorality with this woman. And uh, I know people today, you know, say, uh, who are you to tell me who to love? Well, I'm nobody, but God's everybody. <laughs> God's everything. And God tells us what relationships that are biblical, that are God-honoring, and that are not. And so here, you know, and again, speaking to the church, there was a man who had married his father's wife. And the Bible says that a man should not have his father's wife. And so Paul says the church, he basically rebukes the church in Corinth because they didn't do anything about it. They thought, you know, we're just a grace place. You know, it's just about love, man. And, you know, everybody, we just love it. Paul says, you know, you putting up with this, it's not honorable. You are aiding and abetting sin in the body of Christ. And so he rebukes them. And then he goes on to say here in verse 9, he says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral, immoral people. Yet I, listen, I certainly do not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, the folks you work with or go to school with or in your neighborhood or whatever, or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to get to, to go out of the world. In other words, if you're going to get away from all sinners, you're going to go to a monastery and stuff, you know what? You're going to have to go to the moon. I mean, we'd have to go out of the world. That's foolishness. He says, but now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother. And that's universal, a brother or sister in Christ. Someone who names him, I'm a Christian. I love the Lord. I love me some Jesus. You know, that person who says, says they're a Christian who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reveler or a drunkard or an extortioner, they're ripping folks off. They know they're doing it. They won't repent of it. Not even to eat with such a person. It says they're a Christian, and yet they're living under the influence of the world. Paul says, don't even eat, even eat with them. So it goes like this, a scenario like, you know, some brother, he is, he's got to, you know, find himself. And he runs off with some floozy. And he leaves at home his wife and three kids. They don't know where daddy is. He done moved in with her. And then he calls you up. Hey, bro, what's up? Let's hang, man. Yeah? Well, brother, let me say, you, you know, you still, you're back home now? No, I'm not, you know, man, I, I haven't felt better, man, since I don't. <laughs> she makes me feel, ooh. Yeah? Well, tell you what, when you decide to move back home and come back to the Lord, give me a call. We can hang. But, bro, right now? We ain't hanging. See, now that shocks a lot of Christians. That, that's, that's not compassionate. That's the most compassionate thing you could ever do. Because when you eat with them and you dine with them and you pat them on the back and say, you all right and God is good, you are lying on God. And you're aiding and abetting sin. And the Bible says you find a brother who's caught in a fault, restore him. Or her in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. But if they're not willing to be restored and they just want to keep cheating and the, the kids don't know where daddy is and the wife don't know how to pay the bills because this fool <laughs> has run out on his family. And you having lunch with him and eating and drinking and laughing it up. Paul says that's not admirable. A little Leaven, a little yeast, affects the whole church, the whole lump of dough. And so the best thing you can do is say, no, we can't hang. Now, they're on their way back to the Lord. They want to make things right. Man, grace and mercy. In fact, in 2 Corinthians, Paul addresses the same brother and says, hey, he's repentant. That's enough. Reaffirm your love for him. 
But we're not here playing games. And Jesus is no joke. And so he says here in verse 12, I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, for what have I to do with judging those who are outside? You don't judge the LGBT organization. You don't judge the drunkard. You don't judge people who are lost, who are incarcerated, locked up. You pray for them, and you go to them in Jesus' name. You don't judge them. I'm talking about judgment in the final, in the, in the, in the, in the finality, in a final judgment in that sense. We, we, don't, we don't judge them. We can say that, tell them the truth, speak the truth in love. Where you're going is leading to hell, man. Or, you know, you need to come to Christ. The Lord loves you. We can speak the truth to them. But we don't judge them. We can't say, oh, man, they're done, and we wipe our hands. No. Don't ever discount the power and the grace of God in that person's life. Amen? You never know. But he says, do you not judge those who are inside? Yes, you do. We're held accountable by the word of God. Well, it's my life. No, it's not your life. You're, you bought at a price, and your life belongs to Jesus. And he's the head of the church, and we are the body. And we have discernment about certain things within the church. And so God, we, we have discernment. We can judge matters in the church, not judge in the sense of condemning people, but we can say that's right, that's wrong. And God rebuked the people, the priests in the days of Ezekiel because they did not teach the people so that they could discern between that which was clean and unclean. The word of God tells us what's clean and unclean. Amen? And so Paul says here, we judge that, that which is inside. But those who are outside, God judges. The Lord knows. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. Amen? Now, I said all that to say that we are to go out to the world. It's the world influence inside the church that's, that's not good. But we as a church need to go out to the world, to those who are lost, not to judge them. Some time ago, I received, uh, about two months ago, two, three months ago, I received an envelope in the mail. I don't think it had a name on it, just two pastor owl or something. And, and I opened it and had another folded up note inside, just a little note. Somebody scribbled on it. had $5 in it. And the note said something to the effect of, hey, you know, I lost a bet that you guys could actually fill the Pikes Peak Center and you could actually fill the World Arena. And so here's $5. Now, I wish I had taken it, balled it up, and thrown it away. I was so offended by it. But I spent it. Amen. So I, <laughs> amen. So your mama didn't raise no fool, I'm just saying. I spent that brother $5, amen. But as I thought about it, I was so offended by it because who would bet against the will of God? What narcissistic individual who believes that it should be us four and no more would be against the command of Jesus to go into all the world, that's Colorado Springs, and to be light and salt to our community. Who would bet against the agenda of God? How foolish and how evil that is. This is why we're going to the Pikes Peak Center, because we want an expression of Christ to not just be contained in these four walls, but outside in the community, amen? Go into all the world, he said. That's why we're going. I was so foolish and so offensive to the Lord that you would bet against his agenda. To be salt and light in the world, we must be a friend of the world. Say, wait a minute, I don't know about being a friend of the world, what Jesus was. That was his reputation. He was a friend of sinners, they called him. How are you going to reach the world if you don't befriend the world? Matthew eleven nineteen 19 said he was a glutton, a wine bibber, a bibber. He was a glutton, and he was a friend of sinners. And yes, he was. God so loved the world. Being a friend without participating, however, in the fruit of darkness. Ephesians 5, 11 says, and have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather to expose them. 
The Greek word for fellowship there in Ephesians chapter 5 is sukoinoneo, sukoinoneo, and it means to be a partaker of. In other words, I can still be my neighbor's friend that doesn't know the Lord or that person at work or at school. I can still be their friend, but when they say, hey, man, let's go smoke a doobie. Hey, man, let's go. I don't know if they still call them doobies, but uh, let's go. <laughs> let's go. Let's go. Let's go get drunk or whatever, man. Let's go whatever. Then, hey, man, I'm not, I'm not going to be a part of that. You don't be a part of the unfruitful works of darkness, but you know what? You can still be a friend to that person. And, and you expose their deeds. That's why they don't give you send you anymore the invitation to the Christmas parties. Amen. Because you're going to show up with your light. Amen. <laughs> Probably going to say something about Jesus. <laughs> well, who invited her? You know. Amen. That's why. Because you're a light. And you prick their conscience and they don't want anybody around doing that. Amen. But we're to expose those things. We're not to participate in those things. Be one with them. We need to make ourselves of no reputation like our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's be of no reputation that we might read the people, reach the people who need the redemption of our Lord. Jesus made himself of no reputation that he might reach down to our level. And so we in the church need to do the same. We need to reach the world. So to come out doesn't mean that we are to alienate ourselves from the world and all. But we are to reach them. We are to invite them to our fellowship. We are to invite them to the Easter service. Amen. In conclusion... What does your soul long for? Verse 14 says the things that they long for, their soul long for, you know, in, in Revelation chapter 18, the things they long for, verse 14, have all gone away and have become nothing. Are we longing for Babylon or are we longing for the Bible? Are we longing for the word of God? Jesus said it this way, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. May his word until he comes, be the anchor of our soul. Father, we thank you for the word today.